Victoria 2, the game about imperialism and funny Reddit screen caps. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this community? It can be hard to understand the basic mechanics, such as the UI, government, the economy, and so on. So uh, today I'm going to try to explain to the best of my abilities said mechanics with a um, <coughs> few hours I've put into this game. So without further ado, let's try to understand Vicky 2. Once you load into the game, you will be prompted to choose a country. To the right, you will see information of said country, their flag, status, government type, their ranked prestige, industry score, and military score, their pops, a pie chart of the distribution of said pops, current wars, allies and puppets. To see more in depth, let's take Prussia as an example. At the top you should see tabs for your production, budget, politics, population, trade, diplomacy and military. To your left, at the top, you should see your outline. This acts as a brief overview of your nation, from your armies, territories you are occupying to ones that are being occupied by the enemy, influence and much more. If you can't find it, like I did when you first get into the game, press the little plus button around here. At the bottom you should see a big world map, with various map boats in a little box at the top. These are terrain, political, infrastructure, diplomatic, region, revolt, administrative, colonial, recruitment, national focus, naval, RGO, pop density, culture, sphere, supply, party loyalty, ranking, migration, civilization level, relations, and crisis. You probably won't be using most of these, but later on in the video, we will look at the most relevant ones. On the production tab, you will see a list of your country states and the factories on each state. Each state can have, can have up to a maximum of 8 factories, which can be upgraded up to level 99, increasing the worker cap by 10,000. A level 1 factory can employ 10,000 employees, a level 2 can employ 20,000 and so on. Foreign investment is an overview of the investment great powers have made in other nations that aren't great powers. Production lets you see what goods and in which quantity they are being produced by your country. Also showing their availability in the world market. Projects show the various projects that the capitalist pubs are planning in your country. For example, there is a project to build an artillery factory in Pom... 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 It will require 4,000 pounds, 100 units of iron, cement and machine parts. To the right, you can see how many capitalists have invested in that project. Depending on your economic policy, you may be able to invest into the project to get it going faster. The production of goods can be done by both artisans and factories. As you industrialize, your factories will eventually overgrow your artisans. artisans need to fulfill their needs to be able to produce. If your nation does not have any factories, these are the only way to produce goods. For example, this artisan pub produces ammunition. To be able to produce said ammunition, he needs to fulfill his needs. If he can't afford these goods, he won't be able to produce and start falling into poverty. So try to make these goods cheap and available if you plan to rely on these pubs. Factories are a tad more complicated. They require maintenance goods and input goods. They are normally built by capitalists, depending on the market demand at the time. To function, they need to hire craftsmen and clerks. Craftsmen allow for production, while clerks and capitalists boost said production. Factories will go under depending on changes on the world economy. For example, certain goods becoming too expensive or the good being produced not being profitable anymore. Factories will fire workers to try and keep themselves profitable. The 
Depending on your economic policy, you can subsidize their factories to try to keep them afloat. But personally, if it's not critical industry, sometimes it's better to let them close as the money drain will stack up and make you go into the negatives in your daily income. The math for the production of goods is... Um, yes. I know, numbers are scary, but let me try to simplify it for you. The stuff the factory needs, it's referred to as input goods. The efficiency at which the factory produces these goods, it's through output. And the batch produced from said input goods is referred to as output. You can increase these factors with technology, but we will take a deeper look later on. Now onto budget. On your budget screen, you will see your income and your tax to your social strata. Upper class, middle class and lower class. The sliding bar determines the percentage of the income you are taxing from the strata, but the sliding bar doesn't determine the exact percentage of taxation. If we hover our mouse over the tab, you will see your tax efficiency, the amount gained from tech, and your effective tax, the latter being the real percentage of taxes you are ex extracting for your pops. You can improve your tax efficiency with administrative efficiency and technology, though be careful with overly taxing your pops. If your pubs can fulfill their needs, they will radicalize and in most cases spark an open rebellion within your country. On the bottom, you can see the funds of your national bank and your total funds, your debts, interest of said debts, loans you've taken, and the loans that have been taken from you. Do not be, do not be afraid to take loans to invest in a project or to improve your country's infrastructure, but be careful, because if you let your debt overgrow your economy, you will regret it. On the right, you will see your expenses, your industrial subsidies, military, naval and construction spending, education, administration, social spending, military spending and tariffs at the bottom. You will see your daily balance between income and expenses at the bottom right. Spending in your education increases the literacy of your pubs, facilitating their promotion into other pubs. Increasing your administration efficiency improves your administrative efficiency in your various states. High efficiency improves your pub promotion too. Education and tax efficiency and set state. Military spending increases or decreases the supply status of your army, represented in game as organization. Same goes for naval expenses. As a note, going below 50% spending stops your armies and navies from reinforcing after battles, so Try to keep a watch on it from time to time. Tariffs work as an added cost added to goods by your government entering the country. You can use them to gain a bunch of money to pay for government programs and development. But try not to increase it too much as it will make everything more expensive to your industry and pops. I'll personally recommend not going over 25 to 30, but feel free to try what works for you or the nation you're playing as. On the technology tab, you will see the various tags available for research. These are separated in five main categories. Army, Navy, Commerce, Culture and Industry. Each one of these gives you a bonus upon being researched and gives you various technologies which have a chance of being discovered each month. You can see the percentage of each tag if you hover over it. Research is done through research points these are given by your clerks, and mainly your clergy pops. The technologies require a set amount of research points to be unlocked, and progressively take more points to research certain tags. This video will take hours if we look into all of the technologies, but I will explain the main bonuses given in each column. Army Doctrine lets you build higher level forts and increases your digging cap. Light Armament reduces your combat width and buffs your various army units. Heavy armament buffs your artillery. Military science buffs your army's organization, and army leadership buffs your military tactics and morale. Naval doctrine lets you build higher level naval bases. Construction and propulsion unlocks new types of vessels. Naval engineering 
buffs your construction speed as well as providing passive buffs to ships in the form of technologies. Naval science improves your supply range. Naval leadership improves your Navy's organization. Financial institutions improves your tax efficiency. Monetary system buffs your admin efficiency. Economic thought and critique improves your input for your factories. Market functionality improves your influence and occasionally your RGO. Organization improves your output in your factories. Aesthetics improves your prestige gain. Philosophy multiplies your total research points. Social thought improves your education efficiency and boosts your colonial migration. Political thought increases your total national focus cap. Psychology increases the reinforce rate of your armies as well as the, as the cap of total experience for regiments. Power improves your RGO. Mechanization improves your factory through output. Metallurgy improves your mineral related RGO such as coal, steel, etc. Infrastructure lets you build and operate railways. Chemistry and electricity increases your supply limit. Try to prioritize whichever tag your country needs at the time, but that's up to you to decide. Now onto politics. There are six main ideologies in Victoria too. Reactionaries, conservatives, liberals, socialists, communists and fascists. Each ideology has its own unique policies. You can see all of the policies that each political party advocates for in the politics tab. As a rule of thumb, conservatives want to maintain the status quo. Liberals want to pass political reform. Reactionaries want to reverse political and social reforms. Socialists want to pass social reforms. Communists want to pass social reforms but reverse political reforms. And fascists want to reverse both political and social reforms. As a note, if you put a fascist or a communist government in power, they will eventually coup the government and establish a dictatorship. At the start of the game, you will have reactionaries, conservatives, and liberals. Eventually, around 1860 to 1870, socialists will spawn. Around the turn of the century, communists will spawn. And lastly, around the 1900s, the fascists will spawn. Certain pubs tend to lean into certain ideologies. Aristocrats and officers tend to be reactionary or conservative. Capitalists tend to be liberal. Clerks and craftsmen tend to be socialists. Farmers and soldiers tend to be conservative. This is not a rule, but rather something that tends to happen, though situations in both political and economical contexts can radicalize or change your pop's political views. If your pops have most of their needs fulfilled and don't desire many political changes, they will lean conservative. If your pops have a good situation but have a higher literacy rate, they will lean more liberal and push for political reform. If goods become way too expensive, or rather, as you begin to industrialize, your craftsmen and clerks will lean more socialist, pushing for social reform, for example, pensions, minimum wage, maximum work hours, etc. If your pubs start to be unable to fulfill their daily needs, they will become communist and be very prone to rebel. If your country loses a great war, or if a lot of their core states or provinces are controlled by another nation, they will slowly become fascist. In this section, we will cover all of the policies except for economy. We will toggle that topic more in depth later on. Each party has a set of policies. These are trade policy, economic policy, religious policy, citizenship policy, war policy, and welfare policy. Policies from each political party differs from country to country and later on, different parties from the same ideology spawn. So, take a look closely at the policy of each also. So, take a look closely at the policy of each party. Trade policy has protectionism and free trade. These both determine your allowed tariffs. Economic policy has state capitalism, laissez-faire, interventionism, and planned economy. Religious policy has moralism, pluralism, secularism, and state atheism. Citizenship policy has residency, limited citizenship, and full citizenship. 
war policy has jingoism, pro-military and anti-military. Welfare policy has no set policy, paternalistic and full welfare state. This video will go past the 30 minute mark if we look into all of this individually, but I will explain these factors more in depth later on. Now into economics. The Victoria 2 economy is known for being a mystery and very unstable. I probably won't be able to explain the mechanic fully, but I will explain the basic concepts. RGO means resource gathering operation. These are how resources are extracted from individual provinces and sold into the world market. These are extracted or produced by either farmers or laborers. Farmers are the unskilled workers who harvest crops and tend to animals. Laborers are the unskilled workers who work in the mines. Both are needed for RGO to even produce. And the more there are, the more output a province has. Each province has a work cap. This represents the capacity for production of each province. It can be increased with technology. As a note, some mods such as HPM or HFM add events to increase farms and mine sizes in states once certain technologies are researched. The world market can be seen in your trade tab. There is a set amount of goods in the market. There is both supply and demand. These factors determine the price of goods. Great powers have the first pick on the world market, then the secondary powers, civilized nations, and lastly, uncivilized nations. There are local markets within a great power's sphere of influence. This local market provides raw goods to the great power that's the sphere lord, and the rest is sold to the world market. Secondary powers provide 50% of goods, civilized nations provide 75% of goods, and uncivilized nations provide 100% of goods. You gain prestige once a nation is added to your sphere. The spherelings cannot be called into war against its sphere leader. As a note, having a big sphere will reduce your tariff income since the goods are purchased internally, rather than the world market. The various economic policies allow you to interact in different ways with your economy. Again, political parties and policies differ from country to country, but as a general rule, reactionaries favor interventionism and state capitalism, conservatives favor interventionism and protectionism, liberals favor free trade and laissez-faire, socialists favor free trade and planned economy, communists favor interventionism and planned economy, and fascists favor interventionism and state capitalism. Interventionism, state capitalism, and planned economy allows you to have greater control within your economy, but severely limits the ability of privates to create their own enterprise, and generally require a heavily subsidized industry. Free trade allows you to let your capitalist pubs to freely invest according to market demand, though it severely limits your control over the economy. Take the following with a grain of salt, as I don't have much evidence to back this up, but it's rather something that I've observed. More planned economies are more resilient against recessions, but take longer to recover once it's hit by one. More free market economies crash once a recession hits, but it tends to recover quicker. You can play around and experiment with the different ec economic policies, but try to keep an eye on the world market if you want to have a tighter grip on your economy. Warfare on Victoria 2 is pretty straightforward, but there's more RNG involved than, for example, Hoi 4. There are 11 types of units in Victoria 2. Irregulars, infantry, cavalry, artillery, engineers, guards, dragoons, cuirassiers, hussars, tanks, and planes. These take different roles within a battle. Generally, infantry stands on the first line, facing other units. Cavalry stands at the sides, being able to flank and attack sideways. Artillery stands in the back line, dealing massive amounts of, of damage. It will get mangled by enemy units and deal barely any damage if it's on the first line. Every battle has various modifiers that will determine its outcome. A dice roll, your leader attack skill, digging camp, terrain, fort level, gas, and combat width. 
All of these modifiers affect your losses during the battle, and the army who deorganizes first or just dies <laughs> first loses the battle. As a note, if you want to use gas, you must research military directionism to access the gas attack and defense tech. There are terrain modifiers. You can see them by clicking on a province, but generally, mountains, jungles and forests and swamps favor the defender. Grasslands or farmlands give no strategic advantage to the defender. After the battle is done, you will have to siege the enemy province. You will see it as a little progress bar on top of your army units. Once it's completed, you will be occupying the province, denying your enemies access to its pops and resources. Any unit can siege provinces, but tanks and engineers have a siege modifier that speeds up this process. If said province has a fort in it, in it the siege will last longer depending on the fort level. You, you can mobilize your pops. They will prop up regiments from your poor strata from your accepted culture. This can give you a sizable force at the expense of your economy. Combat width is the length where the battle is taking place in. At first, it's 30 and in late game is 10. This represents the battle, the size of battles over time. Rather than being one big battle deciding the outcome of the war, it's decided by smaller and more bloodier ones. Naval warfare is pretty much the same, but whoever has the fattest plate wins with the newest tech and funding. This means that stacking works. <laughs> there are two types of ships, warships and transport ships. The first are used in combat, and the latter is used to transport troops. You can block blockade enemy ports to increase their war exhaustion. Same goes for provinces. This represents the people's will to continue fighting. The higher the exhaustion, the higher the debuffs your country will suffer. It will only tick down through events or a set amount each month. Each war goal costs a certain amount of war score, and if you go over 100, the AI will not accept the terms. Infamy is gained through events or justifying or adding war goals. If it goes over 25, every great, every great power will gain a containment war goal on you. This will force you to dismantle 50% of your troops and pay, and pay 25% of your daily income to the winning power if you were to capitulate to them. If the enemy or yourself accept the treaty, the war will end and add a 5 year truce, or a 10 year truce if it's a great war. Try not to go into war where you think you can't win, or you will struggle for too long, and try to make alliances, for example, ally Japan is Germany to go against Russia. Also, try to use war exhaustion to your advantage, as it will make your enemies more desperate to peace out, as a high war exhaustion makes you very prone to mass revolution. Cultures are a big part of Wiki 2's gameplay. You can see cultures with your culture map mode. Every nation has a primary culture and accepted cultures. These are the cultures accepted within their country. For example, in Austria, you have South Germans, Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Hungarians, Croats, Serbs, Poles, Ukrainians, and Romanians. But Austria only has South German and Ashkenazi as accepted pubs. But after the Ausgleich, you add Hungarian as an accepted pub. Your non accepted pubs will be prone to higher militancy and administrative efficiency will be lower in the states where they are the majority. There are other factors that affect the different cultures within the game assimilation, religion, and literacy. Assimilation is the process where a cultural minority slowly adopts the language and culture of the larger one. For example, for example, throughout the game, a lot of European cultures will migrate to America, but in time they will assimilate to either Yankee or Dixie cultures. A lot of factors determine assimilation, course, religion, literacy and militancy. For example, when you conquer Alsace Lorraine, when you unify in Germany, as long as France has course in the region, the French minority will not assimilate into German culture. Religion also has a factor in assimilation. If you are a Protestant nation, 
it will be a lot harder to assimilate Catholic pops. Same goes for Jewish, Muslim and other religions. The main conversion you will do is during the colonization of Africa, converting the animist pops into your state religion through your clergy. Literacy has an impact on assimilation too. The higher the literacy of your pops, the higher the chances will assimilate. After being taught to read and write in the language. There is also another way to um, get rid of minority cultures, but those are reserved for totalitarian ideologies like an absolute monarchy or a communist dictatorship or a fascist dictatorship. But this um, final solution comes with great devops to local production and local militancy. Generally, if you get political rights and a good quality of life to your pops, you will keep their militancy low and they will slowly assimilate over time. If you have arrived to this part of the video, um, thank you for watching. It's uh, my first time I use my voice in a video like this. I'm thinking of making another one, going more in depth into the more advanced mechanics, but I'm not completely sure when I'll start doing it. I hope I helped you understand the mess of a game that is Piki 2. If you got any doubts, you can comment them down below, and I'll do my best to try and resolve your doubts. You can also check out my Twitter, where I generally shit post or retweet cute girls doing cute things. You know, that kind of weep shit. Anyways, thank you for watching, and have a nice day.